And joining us now to give us her perspective on last night's uh, episode of The Ultimate Fighter Season 18. You know her from the show and uh, from Toshido MMA out on the West Coast. The pride of the Sunshine Coast, BC, Sarah Cheesecake Morris. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing great. Always a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, yeah, last night's episode, uh, a lot of fun to watch as well. We had some good Canadian content. We'll talk about that in a second. But the episode kicked off with uh, a recap of the great fight, uh, Rocky Pennington, uh, with the great win last week. And uh, we saw Dana White giving her a bit of a pep talk and uh, uh, imploring her, really, to use her hands more. Uh, what did you think of the boss giving Rocky a pep talk like that? Um, well... I mean, it kind of sucks at the time because, you know, he doesn't pull everyone aside. But at the same time, you know, I don't really need that extra motivation or that extra encouragement from him. I know I'm there to do my thing. So it didn't really bother me like it probably did other people. <laughs> it uh, seemed to bother Juliana Pena. You know, the, she said, oh, but Dana told me he's rooting for me to win the whole show. Do you think this is just Dana, you know, kind of hedging his bets? Because I don't think he cares who wins the show because he's going to make money regardless. But uh, is that uh, just uh, an ego thing or for Juliana? How did you view that? Um, okay, so Juliana, she's she's a bit strange, obviously. But, um, like, the whole time in the house, she'd, like, wake up and be like, oh, I just had a dream this morning that... It, that I was dating Dana and blah, blah, blah. Like, so she was maybe a bit obsessed with Dana. So I think if he said anything to her, she probably took it to the next level and <laughs> uh, that he could only be saying it, anything nice to her and not to anyone else. So you think uh, Dana may have just passed by her once and said hi and she made the rest up in her head? <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure she probably talked to him. Um, she sort of seems to, like, get in there and, you know, make people talk to her rather than... I'm guessing it's probably her approaching Dana rather than Dana approaching her. <laughs> I'm sure they had some sort of conversation. All right, uh, fair enough. Did Dana tell you at any point uh, during the filming that he wanted you to win? <laughs> no, I never really talked to Dana much. All right, so there you go. At least, you know, the boss may be playing favorites a bit, but uh, at least, you know, you're going to get through on talent alone, as you always have. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter to me. All right, and uh, further on in the episode, uh, Ronda Rousey brought uh, Father's Day gifts for uh, all the fathers in the house who were obviously missing their kids at that point, and even one for Cody, too, who is you know not on her team, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, I thought it was a really nice thought, but you know, I thought some more about it, and I thought, well, it's, it's great of her to do that, but like when you see trinkets like that and you just get reminded of what you're missing, wouldn't it make you miss it even more? Um... Possibly. I mean, I don't have kids, and I, so it's kind of different. I think the thought's nice, but, yeah, it'd probably remind you more of your kids. But I think on a day like Father's Day, you're thinking about your kids anyways. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you know, you were around uh, the guys afterwards. Uh, what was uh, their mood after uh, Rosie brought the gifts? Um, I think, well, like, Davey was pretty stoked. Um, Chris Veal's always pretty quiet, and... And I think Cody was starting to miss home after that. So I think they all sort of had different reactions mm. from it. But, yeah, it was, I thought it was a nice gesture from Ronda to think about that and, you know. Yeah, it really was. And Cody, you know, on the episode last night, seemed to have a bit of a monologue there. He was sitting by himself but uh, speaking out loud. Is that the kind of thing that's kind of uh, influenced by the producers? You know, like uh, you know, just when you've got a camera on you like that, do they kind of pro poke you and prod you and say, well, say what's on your mind, say what's on your mind? Because I, I don't know about you, but I don't sit around and talk to myself if there's no one in the room. <laughs> um, it sort of depends. Like... Usually it's not like that, but sometimes they'll sort of take you away and do an interview with you in a more public place rather than in the confessional room. So it it just depends. So I have no idea if someone was standing there, like, asking them questions and they sort of cut it and tasted it or not because I wasn't there. But they never really did that to me. They only took me aside and interviewed me at times where I wish I wasn't getting interviewed. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and uh, the prank of the week and now from Misha and her crew was uh, the Edmund Rosie thing. Uh, apparently uh, an unflattering picture. Uh, it was all blurred out, though. They said it was a character in a movie. What character was it? Did you see the pictures? 
It was, um, I think it's in Dodgeball or something like that with that crazy chick with the unibrow that looks like a dude with the big mole on her face and the two, like, buns in her hair. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. I, I, um, I'm thinking don't Zoolander. Don't follow movies very well. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe in Zoolander or something like that. But, uh, oh, yeah, possibly. Something like that. Yeah, Sheldon's got a, a picture up there on the screen. Not, not a very... Uh, not a very flattering portrait of uh, either uh, Edmund or Rhonda, whoever is supposed to be. Dana White clearly didn't like it. Uh, why do you think Dana decided to draw the line uh, right there as far as pranks go? Because uh, we talked about it last week. You know, we've seen all kinds of pranks, uh, you know, gone back and forth on the Ultimate Fighter, especially between like Bisping and Mayhem and uh, Rampage uh, you know, taking Rashad's uh, locker room and making it all pink and fluffy and everything like that. Why do you think that crossed the line with Dana White specifically? Um, I think it's mostly just, like, the last season they tried to change things up a bit and make it more about fighters and not about being douchebags. So, um, I think from the beginning he sort of said no pranks. I mean, I wasn't around, but just judging from what Rhonda's been saying, you know, promising that she wouldn't do pranks, I'm sure he didn't just make her promise. I'm sure it was Misha, too, and Misha just doing pranks anyways. Yeah. Uh. Well, uh, D Dana, yeah. <laughs> Dana did uh, miss the one on the walk around there. It was uh, left up in the sun, and uh, Anthony Gutierrez uh, was uh, helpful enough to alert Edmund to that. Uh, Edmund to that. What well, was that kind of a rat move on his part? Do you think? <laughs> he, yeah, he like he knew it was there, and he talked to us before he even told Edmund. He's like, I think we might have even told him that there was one still in the sauna. And then he went and told Edmund or something. So it, it wasn't like he found it and he showed Edmund. It was, yeah, I'm not even sure how it happened, but we all knew about it before they, before he told Edmund or anything like that. It just seemed like one of those teacher, teacher kind of moments, you know? <laughs> yeah, he likes to start shit and just be, he's a bit weird like that. All right. And Rhonda had a very negative reaction to it as well. Uh, she said it was racist, which I'm not sure if I found it racist or not, because don't people of all ethnicities have unibrows? Like, I'm not saying it was in good taste. I'm not even saying it was funny, but racist seemed like an odd term to throw out there. <laughs> yeah, I thought that too. I mean, I tweeted it as well. Like, are unibrows racist? Yeah. Um, I never thought of it like that. Oh. Yeah, like is, is there a, a class of people known as the you know the the Unibrowians or the Unibrowies that we should be apologizing to or something? I think it's the Armenians. <laughs> I don't know if it's more insulting that she said like basically that all Armenians have unibrows <laughs> or the other way around where unibrows are racist. So I I don't know. I think it's more her being racist saying that than anything. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it, you know, because I wouldn't have thought it was impugning all Armenians unless she said something about it. Yeah. Oh, well. Anyway, well, I, I'm not sure about Rhonda's take on race relations, but I was really impressed at uh, the agility displayed last night on the episode uh, during the scooting drills. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, admittedly, I suck at grappling, but, you know, when I'm doing the little shrimping on uh, on the mats and everything like that, I'm not moving half as fast as she is just moving her abs like that. I was blown away at her dexterity. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. I mean, I've seen some interviews and videos of her training where she does stuff like that, so I I sort of expected to see it in one of these episodes. Um, to me, though, it sort of reminded me of Willy Wonka when they, like, drink the stuff that they're not supposed to drink or whatever, and they start floating up, and they need a burp <laughs> to get down, and they're, like, in the air making these weird movements. That's sort of what it reminded me of watching it. I, I wouldn't have thought of that, but to now I'm, I'm watching it back and you mentioned it, I can definitely see that. So there you go, a cheesecake one for one on the pop culture references here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about the fight itself. Uh, Michael Wooten taking on the gentleman Josh Hill, Canada's own, and uh, they seem to portray it in the episode as a tough weight cut for Wooten. Uh, was there any feeling on Team Tate that uh, Wooten may, you know, uh, may fade during the fight because of that weight cut? Um... No, like, Wooten's crazy. Like, from what from what he's told us, he, at uh, the tryouts, he was 175, so he's always done really big weight cuts. So I don't think any of us thought that would affect him in any way because he's done that for all of his fights. 
And the fight itself, I mean, the first round really seemed to be a textbook round for Josh. You know, a, a big slam really made Wooten kind of carry his weight. But uh, as it went on in the second round, a big knee from Wooten and uh, Josh's decision to jump into a guillotine in round two as well, to me, it really seemed to change the momentum of the fight. Yeah, the fight definitely changed in the second round. Um, I don't know. I'm not really like, I'm one of these weird people that don't really like to watch fights. So especially when they're three rounds, I get kind of bored. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never heard a fighter say that to me before. That's awesome. <laughs> but, yeah, it's kind of strange. Like, I don't like watching UFC or anything unless there's chick fights, you know, see the competition. But other than that, I'm not really a fan of the sport. I, I was not expecting you to say this today. I'm learning all kinds of things about cheesecake. This is awesome. <laughs> but in the third round, uh, Josh Hill seemed to miss that, that spinning back fist to Alachael Sonnen in the second Anderson Silva fight. Do you think that cost him the round and, by extension, the fight? Um, yeah, I definitely think that cost him the round and the fight. Um, I mean, you never really know what would have happened if that part didn't happen, but I think that was the end of the fight for him, for sure. Yeah. And uh, on on the fight as a whole, do you think that Wooten's reach factor was uh, the main factor here? Because, you know, Josh, he's a short, stocky guy, and uh, Wooten, for the most part, was able to, you know, uh, after that first round anyway, was able to keep him, you know, where he was able to use his limbs the most effective. Um, I don't know. I don't really think about reach and stuff like that. I think it just sort of depends how you go into that fight, how you prepared for that fight, how you warmed up and everything like that. And I don't know. I know I had some issues with um, the cornering and stuff like that, so I don't know if he also did or not. But, yeah, so I don't know. There's different things that play into effect in that house that you wouldn't have to deal with back home. Now, that's interesting. You said you had issues with the cornering. I thought that Misha's statement that, you know, uh, she she wanted Josh to make uh, Wooten respect his hands first, then work on the ground later, uh, you know, that kind of seemed counterintuitive to me, you know, especially when you're as great a grappler as Josh is, and, you know, British fighters, you know, the, the stereotype on them is that, you know, they're effective with their hands, not so much on their backs. Why not let Josh just do what he's great at and just, you know, uh, suffocate Wooten, for lack of a better term? Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. You know, he knows what he's good at. He's good at it, so why not do it? But, yeah, I mean, things are different there, so it's all sort of a learning experience. Yeah, absolutely. What would you think of Rosie flipping off Misha Tate after the fight? Uh, it actually made me laugh. It was kind of funny. <laughs> so you didn't really view it as kind of a, you know, an insult or anything more insulting than what's been going on between the two of them anyway? Um, I think, I think she sort of got a fair point, you know, like, she's sort of being real the whole time, and Misha's playing all these pranks and going on behind her back, and then, like, wants a handshake when there's cameras around, so I, <laughs> I sort of see where she's coming from, I think I'd probably do something similar if I were in her shoes, so I'm not, I'm not going to talk shit about her doing that. All right, fair enough. And, you know, next week is a highlight episode, but when they come back from that, two weeks from now, we finally get cheesecake inside the cage, and uh, we got uh, the, the dirty jobs of Mike Rowe guy, whoever that announcer is, you know, characterizing you as a scrappy grappler. Are you happy with that characterization? Um, I don't care what people call me. Uh, I go into my fights, and I go in to win, so if you want to call me a scrappy grappler, I don't care. <laughs> At least it's entertaining rather than the boring wrestler or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, what did you think of Dana being that uh, critical of Josh Hill and his style? Um, honestly, I can sort of see where he's coming from, although, uh, however you want to fight, you win fights, you know, whether it's wrestling or striking. I think a lot of people are overly into the striking rather than the whole aspect of MMA where it's different, different martial arts all mixed together, right, where the fight can go to the ground or you can just take people down the whole time. Um, there's so many different aspects to it and how you choose to make it work for you shouldn't really be classified as different 